Hi everyone, my name is Isaac Ibiapina and I'm going to be explaining to you the DAO hack and all its details. A year ago, there was a smart contract called the DAO and it had the largest crowdfund ever. It raised $120 million or 11.5 million ether and it made news all over the world. It was supposed to mark the beginning of a revolution in fintech and maybe it did, but really it marked the shortcomings of working with a bleeding edge technology because an attacker drained about $50 million of it via a bug in its code. So you might be asking, what is a smart contract and how did it get hacked? I'm going to get into that and also further explain what the DAO is, give you an example of, of a regular code snippet that you would find and then go, go into the actual detail of the code that was in the DAO. So to begin, what is a smart contract? Well, it's just code, just like that. But of course, there's a difference between this kind of code and the kind of code that you run in your REPL or your regular text editor. This code is deployable on a blockchain, which means it has very unique properties. The foremost of which is immutability, meaning that once it's deployed, you can't take it back. It's there forever. You can't control C out of it. You can't stop the server or anything. Once you deploy it, that code is reproduced onto thousands of nodes all over the world into pretty much a global runtime environment that's always running. So the, the, the thing to think of is that the code is the law. So like a real contract, this code has some power of affecting things of tangible value. Like you may probably have heard of Bitcoin where a Bitcoin right, I mean, may, or, may or may not have value to you, but to the market, it does. And, and the same f applies for Ether in the Ethereum blockchain. So unlike uh, a real contract, this is always enforceable, meaning that you don't have to trust a, on a second party to follow through on their end or anybody interacting with their contract to do what they're going to do. The code is always going to do what it's always going to do for better or worse. So it's important to remember that this is all running on a, on a one single runtime environment that never stops. So now generally that you understand what a smart contract is, that's pretty much what the DAO is. It's just this, but much more, much more complicated. It was about a thousand lines of code actually. And once you understand that, you will further understand that really the DAO was unintentionally the biggest bug bounty ever. A thousand lines of code for $120 million. Pretty epic. So let's get into what the DAO is. The DAO is pretty much just a word that people gave to the smart contract. I mean, there's nothing in the code that really is, means, means anything, which stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. And its entire purpose was to be sort of an online Kickstarter where people would send money to it and then all that pooled money could be used to fund business ideas. And it sounded pretty good at the time, and it was, eventually. But pretty much the way it worked was that, assuming you send money to it, y you could propose an idea. And based on that idea, you could vote on it based on the DAO tokens you received. And the DAO tokens you received would be received in proportion to the amount of ether that you sent to it. So really, uh, DAO tokens were a representation of voting rights. You would send Ether, get your voting rights, then you could vote for ideas, you know, like if you want to vote for a hoverboard company to make hoverboards, you could, you could send them X amount of your, your DAO tokens, and other people could also vote on that. And the way the DAO worked specifically was that it would actually spin off a child DAO under it, like a brand new contract onto the blockchain, and it would be endowed with a reward of Ether, which is sort of right now the de facto money of the Ethereum blockchain. And it would use that Ether to fund its business operations. It's important to note that a child DAO was spun out of, of the parent DAO, which is kind of, cri kind of critical in the next part once I get into the exploit. So before we get into the hack, Let's just give a quick uh, example of code so you don't get totally lost once I get into the weeds. This is an example of solidity. And if it looks readable to you, it should be. 
because Solidity is the JavaScript of the Ethereum programming languages. Of course, like JavaScript, it's high level, and it's also compiled down into a lower level language. In this case, it's like an assembly-like bytecode kind of language that you really don't want to read. But let's just go over this a little bit so you can familiar, familiarize yourself with it. As you can tell, it, this is pretty much like JavaScript, but with types. And also kind of weird types. Because you, you see here this type called address, owner. I mean, that kind of thing doesn't exist in regular programming languages. But you can see that has a constructor, just like a, just like a regular JavaScript class does, which initializes a few states and has functions. So in this, so in this example, it's declaring two state variables at the top, a number, and, it, and it's declaring an address variable named owner. And when the contract is initialized, I just gave it the store number an arbitrary value of 1,000 and set the owner variable equal to message.sender. Message.sender would be the person or would be the address that created this contract. And here is just an arbitrary, arbitrary function that, of course, declares the types and the parameters and the return value. And in this case, it increments the, the state. And at the bottom, you have a standard kill function which is if message.sender equals owner, meaning if whoever calls this function is the owner that was initializing the contract, it would kill the, it would kill the contract, delete its state off the blockchain, which, which is a good thing, and send all funds to the owner. So it's a little weird, but really it's not that difficult from, for JavaScript. So let's get into a couple of Ethereum concepts that you'll need to know. One is that accounts are basically the core of everything that contracts are about. You know, no, uh, there, are no, there is no pointless computing ha happening on the Ethereum blockchain because it is very expensive and slow. You can kind of think of it as like programming on like a late 90s smartphone. You know, you, everything you need to do needs to be very efficient because otherwise you're spending money on computations that are just pointless. So, all code is pretty much working around, around accounts, which, is, which can either be an externally controlled account, which you can think of as like a regular account that you would own, and ca contract controlled accounts, which are contract codes that s somebody actually deploys and is then only manipulable by its code. And lastly, there's a, something called a fallback function, uh, fallback function, which means that if a, call, if a contract is called in some weird way that it's not supposed to be, like if, it's, like if somebody tries to call a function on it doesn't exist, there's this default catch-all function that runs whatever kind of arbitrary code you run, run onto it, and it should, it's just sort of account for that uh, random instance. So now that we've done that, let's get into the actual code that was in the DAO. Now, there's actually a lot going on here that's certainly outside the scope of this presentation, but I'm going to just go over the critical points, and, and let's start getting started. So here is just a function called split DAO. It takes an unsigned integer, and, and it's called proposal ID, an address, it's called new creator, and it takes a couple of function modifiers. Which means that in this, well, in this case, since I've looked up, I looked up what they actually do. No ether means that nobody can call this function and also send it ether, and only DAO token holders can call it. Which means that, of course, since it's a public function, anybody on the Ethereum blockchain can go ahead and call this. But if they're not DAO token holders, it'll throw an error and nothing gets run. So, so let's assume that a regular DAO token holder did call this function. This part would not throw an error. This error middle, this error uh, handling error would not throw an error. And we get down to this critical part right here, which is the invocation of the withdraw reward for, and it, and it calls it on the message at sender, which is the, the, the person or the account that called this contract. This pretty much uh, initiates a whole chain of logic that pays out the ether to the child DAO, and which gives control to whoever, to whoever holds those tokens to fundamentally that ether that is then spun out for that business. And then after this uh, function is invoked, over here, over here only then are the hash tables that, that take into account the total amount of ether held in the parent DAO 
and the total amount of tokens held in the parent, in the parent DAO. And if you're, if you're any, any what security minded, that kind of might be an issue you can see, because you can see here that the, the payment logic for here is set before, before the variables that actually uh, control the ether and the DAO tokens are adjusted. So we'll see, we'll see how that works more specifically. So over here, the withdraw reward for function is invoked, and here it is. Its main, uh, the relevant part here is that it calls a payout function right here, which I've also mentioned right here. Now, at this point, once the chain, once the chain of execution reaches here, the, the recipient, the, uh, the, the sender of the, of the message has, has already received his ether. But over here, this line right here, um, actually, actually gives an opportunity uh, for the, the, recipi uh, the recipient address's fallback function to execute, which means arbitrary code. And, and something the, the curators of this contract did not account for was recursion. And now nobody knows what, what the actual code was in, in the fallback function. I just made a, a pseudocode right here, which is message.sender, which is, which is whichever function called uh, the, the attack contracts code, it would call the split DAO of that function. So picture the call stack right now. I'll, put, I'll move this back so we can see it. Split DAO is called, withdraw reward 4 is called, it goes to withdraw reward 4, goes to payout, then here it recursively goes to split DAO and back. So now you can picture the call stack. It's going withdraw reward 4, payout, fallback function, recursive call to split DAO, and on and on and on and on. And the, the, the attacker did this with 258 ether and he, and he got about 3.6 million out of it. And you can see that over here on the recursion, that's what all happened right bef uh, before any, any of these lines were executed. So recursion is, is a bitch. And the implications of this were that the Ethereum blockchain had to fork and I had something to talk about today. So, thanks. <laughs>